uh, I mean, جزاكم الله خير اخي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاه والسلام على سيدنا محمد خاتم الانبياء والمرسلين. I really have the great honor to uh, introduce uh, uh, Dr. Hassan Shamsi Basha. Uh, MashaAllah, uh, I know he's very well known and he's beyond uh, uh, to introduce him, but it, it would be really fair just to mention a few uh, words before we start our uh, new series for the uh, history of Islamic medicine series of the Federation of Islamic Medical Associations, which uh, we've been running for the last few months. Dr. Hassan Shamsi Basha is a, is a consultant uh, cardiologist in, uh, in uh, Jeddah. Formerly, he was uh, working as cardiologist in uh, King Fahd uh, uh, Armed Forces in uh, Saudi Arabia also. Uh, Dr. Hassan is very well known um, on publishing many books, mashallah, and articles. He had over uh, probably maybe uh, 65, 67 different uh, books on uh, health education, on medical ethics, and, and um, on um, Islamic uh, health guidance as well. Um, he, uh, he was the author uh, uh, of the very famous book on the contemporary, uh, contemporary uh, bioethics Islamic perspective, which is published a few years ago in English. Uh, he is also a member of the uh, board of directors of uh, the Saudi Heart Foundation. Uh, this is actually almost for 10 years between 95 till uh, 2005. Uh, he's currently uh, a member of the uh, editorial uh, uh, board of uh, several uh, medical journals, and also he's a counselor uh, to the International Islamic Fuqah Academy since '92, um, and he's interested in uh, the field of uh, uh, medical ethics. Uh, Dr. Hassan, mashallah, he uh, uh, produced many uh, TV shows as well. Has been interviewed many times in a different uh, uh, TV channels, and he gave. Uh, uh, many talks as well in English as well as in in Arabic. I'll hand it over to uh, Dr. Hassan, and uh, we're really looking forward to to hear about uh, the uh, uh, Islamic uh, uh, medical ethics from mainly. Um, we're hoping as well to get to touch on the historical side, and I'll leave it to, to him, please, to uh, uh, start. Zakallah khair, Dr. Hassan. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيد الخلق والمرسلين. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Sharif, for this nice introduction and congratulations for the professorship uh, you just had recently. Uh, you deserve it. Um, I think I will start now screen. Uh, I think uh, sharing the screen. <clears throat> Still host disabled participant screen. Can somebody uh, let me share the screen, please? Yeah. Yes. That's okay now. I think I'm okay. Uh, we need, this is the lecture. Okay, then. Thank you very much. I think we are home and dry. Bismillah rahman rahim I've been asked actually by Professor Sharif to give this topic on Islamic contribution to medical ethics. And uh, I think I will try to do my best in summarizing or highlighting the contribution of Islamic medical ethics. Now, we know actually that the impact of Islamic civilization on the Western science and medicine in the era between 19th and 13th century is not well remembered by many in the West, unfortunately. And we know during that period, many Muslim scholars and doctors were building on the work of Greeks and Romans and making discoveries that continued to influence medical practice for several centuries. This is actually a nice article published in 2007 in Canadian Medical Association Journal. And the title is very clear, Islam's Forgotten Contribution to medical science. 
And what it says actually that many Western historians underestimate the contribution of physicians of the medieval Islamic world, and they usually are perceived as simple purveyors of the Greek science to the scholars of Renaissance. And this fact is completely wrong. It's not actually a fact, it's really a fake. And I will show you evidence for that in a moment, just talking about the contribution in medical ethics, let down the contribution in other parts of medicine and surgery, et cetera. Now, this is a nice paper in the BMG in 2005, how Islam changes changed medicine, and they quoted King William saying that buildings in Andalusia, in Andalusia uh, are reminders of the architectural imprint of the Islamic civilization. But less well remembered is the impact of this civilization on Western science, technology, and medicine between the years 800 and 1450. And until a couple of centuries again, Arabic, we know that for a fact, was the medium of communication throughout the Muslim world, regardless of the type of activity, whether it's religious, social, or scientific. And during that period, essentially most of scientific works were written in Arabic. And it's only until colonization of the Muslim lands when actually this practice changed. Lawrence Conrad in the Companion Encyclopedia of the History of Medicine has written it clearly that the language of the Arabs became the common cultural denominator of the medieval Middle East and was spoken as the lingua franca, but not only by not only Muslims, but even Christians and Jews as well. Now, many historians claim that the Western world pioneered the setting of ethical, legal, and professional standards in medicine. And some even propose that the concept, the medical consent, is an American invention. And we'll show that this is not true later on. Others claim that patients' rights and legal protection proposals have been stated in the early decades of the 20th century. Now we know this, these two persons very well for everyone working on medical ethics, the Butchamp and Childress, who in 1979 published this famous book on principles of bio, chem, biomedical ethics. And they actually concentrated on these four principles of ethics, the autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. And we will show that actually these are, have foundations and roots in Islamic uh, culture and Islamic Sharia. Now, the concept of bioethical principles has since 1979 considered as purely Western innovation, and it's absent in Islamic healthcare system. And this is not true. The Islamic medical ethics also upholds the four basic principles. There is no question about that. And the Muslim physician should make a decision in the best of interest of the patient, whether Muslim or non-Muslim. And without imposing his or her religious views on the patient. Now these bioethical principles, the four I mentioned, have been legitimized by Muslim jurists as falling into the sphere of the Islamic law and have been supported by Quranic verses and uh, tradition as well. There are, of course, many differences in the details, particularly in the autonomy a principle. Now, we know bioethical deliberation is inseparable from the religion itself. We're talking about Islam which emphasize continuities between body and mind, material and spiritual realms, uh, spiritual realms, and between ethics and jurisprudence. And of course, the Islamic bioethics is an extension of Islamic law, which is based on the two foundations, the Quran and Sunnah. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the Quran, many terms describe the concept of ethics. We have khair, 
the goodness, maslaha, public interest, bir, righteousness, kist, which is uh, kist, which is equity, adil, equilibrium and justice, haq, which is truth and right, ma'roof, and so on. All of these actually are in the basic principles of Islam, and they are in the concepts of basic concepts of ethics. Above all, the Quran commands Muslim to not to do any uh, good only, but also to forbid evil's action. And for Muslims, being rational does not mean only to justify things intellectual, intellectually, but also to examine every single aspect of moral conduct to determine whether such behavior aligns with the Islamic law or not. Now, one of the major principles and incentives in Islam for any health professional worker, not only doctors, nurses, technicians, anyone working in medicine, for this ayah or this verse, if anyone saved a life, it would be as if he saved the lives of all mankind, 8 billion people, saving 8 billion people. And this, as I said, does not apply only to physicians. It applies to the nurse looking after the patient, to the technician looking after the patient. And we've seen, we've just seen in UK, the nurse who killed eight newborns. So this actually applies to everyone in healthcare system. There is another hadith, which is very famous, and that encourage people to take medicine and to be treated. And God said, Allah, our prophet Muhammad said, Allah has sent down both the disease and the cure. He has appointed a cure for every disease. So treat yourselves medically, but use nothing and lawful. There is another major principles in medical ethics to do things in a perfection way. And this is actually hadith of Prophet Muhammad. Allah loves someone who when works, he performs, performs it in a perfect manner. And this is actually very important, again, for any health worker uh, facing patients every day. Another incentive for doctors and nurses, again, this is actually, we all go every morning to see patients in the world round. But many of us, unfortunately, do not have the intention that they are visiting that patient. And the Prophet Muhammad says, he who visits the sick continues to remain in the fruit garden of paradise until he returns. So if you go in the world round in the morning and visit the patient, this is if you make the intention that you want actually to relieve the patient's harm, to uh, put a smile on his face and to give him some hope, this actually you are living in, a, in the paradise during that time until you return back. There is another hadith also says that when you do that in the morning, 70,000 angels will send the blessing upon that person until the evening, and the same thing if it is done in the evening. One can easily find all these universal principles, the, one, the four ones which I mentioned, not only in the Holy Quran, but it among the saying of the Prophet Muhammad and also in the teaching of many a great Muslim scholars throughout the, history, throughout the history. Let's start with autonomy. Now, autonomy means, of course, self-rules. And we know in Quran that there is no compulsion in religion and that actually each person has the full will to accept Islam or refuse it. Whoever wills, let him believe, and whoever wills, let him disbelieve. And the Quran said to the Prophet Muhammad, will you, Muhammad, then compel mankind until they become believers? So that actually, this autonomy principle is the base of Islamic Sharia. Now, of course, there are 
there are uh, 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 religious morality which is not compatible with the human freedom and responsibility. Now, we cannot do everything according to our wish. There are limits, of course. We cannot, I don't uh, want, I want actually to change my sex, for example, as it is happening nowadays. I cannot do it because there are, of course, limitations to this type of autonomy. And now we see the dangers and the uh, problems occurring with these uh, people, uh, the transgenders, when we see that 40% are having either suicide or suffering severe depression, and so on. Now, Islam does not permit man to act as he wish, but limits him with certain rules. I cannot ask for mercy kill killing just because I fed up with life. Of course, there is limit for such type of autonomy. Now, uh, the, the beneficence is so intimate to the principle of non-maleficence. And we know that beneficence implies the acts of mercy, kindness, charity, altruism, love, and humanity. And these are all in the uh, roots of Islam and many hadith and many verses in the Quran. Beneficious uh, in the Islam is plenty of ayahs and hadith are talking about this. And the one of them, actually the Quran says, so whoever does good equal to the weight of an atom, even the weight of an atom, which is so minute, shall see that effect. And whoever does evil equal to the weight of an atom shall see that in the hereafter. So this is actually the major principle. And the Prophet Muhammad says in a famous hadith, the best of you is the one who is most beneficial to others. The best of you is not the one who does so many ruka, is the best of you is the one who is most beneficial to others. And he also says, whoever can do anything beneficial to one of his brothers, he should just do it. The other concept that of our principles of the modern bioethics, the non-maleficence. And the Prophet Muhammad said that in two words, la darar wa la dirar. There should be neither harming nor reciprocating harm. You should not injure yourself or do not, you should not injure other people as well. I lost the screen now. I don't know what happened. Okay, I will go back to it. Yes. Okay. So the, uh, the it's amazing to find in the sayings of Prophet Muhammad, Ordering Muslim do and promote good, remove evil or harm, and prevent evil or harm. These are all in the Prophet Muhammad Hadith. I can give you so many of them. And one of the major axioms in jurisprudence, like avoiding harm takes a precedence over bringing good. Jalbul maslaha muqaddam ala daful mafsada muqaddamun ala jalb al maslaha. And the first thing is to thwart off the harm. And this is actually is very uh, clear in Islam. Justice, the fourth principle, and many verses in Quran, almost 16 ayah, talking about justice. And it is actually even the purpose of sending the prophets, as God said, is to establish justice in the world. Indeed, we have sent our messengers with the clear proofs and reveal with them the scripture and the balance justice that mankind may keep up justice. Justice is a comprehensive term and may include all virtues of philosophy and Islam asks something for something even warmer than justice, which is returning good for ill. Now it is fair at the end of this part of my lecture to say that the roots of these four principles of bioethics are present in Islamic teachings. Of course, there are some differences 
in particularly in the understanding of autonomy. And this is actually a certainly uh, there between the Western and Islamic uh, ethics. Now, when we come to medical responsibility, the Prophet Muhammad sum it up in one hadith. If someone practices medicine and he has no knowledge in medicine, he is responsible for his act. So this is a clear cut. And uh, this is actually this consent and liability. We have actually seen that clearly in many books and in many scholars uh, books written on that subject. Now, one of the first book written in Prophet, on Prophet medicine by uh, Ibn Abdullah Abdul Malik Ibn Habib, and that's an Andalusian, uh, Andalusian uh, doctor and physician. Uh, he actually stated clearly in this book that to practice medicine, the practitioner should be licensed by the muhtasib. We'll talk about that in a moment. He should obtain the consent of the patient if he has not fulfilled one or both, then he is liable. And we read also things about medical ethics in the Prophet Medicine book uh, written by Ibn Qayyim al jawziyah He actually talked about the human behavior and ethics. He actually mentioned that the physician should be well-trained and keen on getting his job carried out in the best way. Now, licensing started in the Islamic history way back to 931, when the Khalifa al-Muqtadir learned that a patient died as a result of physician's error. He ordered his chief physician, Sinan bin Thabit ibn Qurra, to examine all those practicing medicine at that time. And in one year, he examined and licensed 860 uh, physicians in Baghdad alone. Now, the muhtasib, the concept of ihtisab or hisba, is actually peculiar in Islam. And it does not apply only to medicine. It applies to trades and every single act in Islam. Licensing boards were set up under the government official muhtasib or inspector general who monitors the qualification, the exigent legal standard in Arabic medicine. And after 1,000 years, we found the licensing of physician started in being implemented in the West, such as stated license, licensing board in medicine and surgery and so on. Now, it is possible that Al-Ma'moon and Al-Mu'tasim initiated in Baghdad, what they initiated in Baghdad for the al husba principles and incorporating that in the government system, it paved the way for the first government enforcement of ethical codes for the health professionals. And there are several papers published on the hisba in Islam and health system, one of them uh, uh, written by Sami Hamarna and the other one here by Shahabuddin. Now, several books were published in hisba in Arabic. And among them, this one is a famous one, which is written by uh, Shazari, Abdul Rahman Shazari, who died in 1094. Now, this book, actually, there is a chapter, chapter 37 in it. It's involving only husband on uh, doc physicians uh, and surgeons, etc. And what actually we found that the system is Hisba was first brought to the attention of the Western world in 1860 by Walter uh, Bernard. Now, we come on to the famous books written on Islamic medical ethics. With Dr. Albar, I've written actually an editorial a few years ago on Islamic medical ethics 1,000 years ago, and focusing on two major books which are fully devoted to uh, medical ethics. And this is really amazing, which is written 1,000 years. The first one written by Ishaq al-Rahawi, and the second one was written by Abu Bakr al-Razi. And these famous uh, physicians as well, 
They both have written the earliest and most thorough books on medical ethics, as I said, and they both build their knowledge upon themes from the Hellenistic medical tradition, but they incorporated that with the Islamic traditions. Now, one, this is actually Adab al-Tabi by Ar-Rahawi, is one of the uh, famous books written on this subject. He is a Christian and who probably embraced Islam. Ar-Rahawi actually was contemporary to Abu Bakr al-Razi. Both lived in the second half of the ninth century. And this book was translated into English by Martin Levy in 1967. Our moderator and uh, uh, Dr. Sharif Al-Kaf Al-Ghazal, he wrote actually a very nice paper uh, in 2004, and he focused on uh, this book of our Ishaq Al-Rahawi and the other one, uh, Fardos Al-Hikmah. He actually summed up the titles of this, the two chapters of Adab Al-Tabib, and look at these actually titles that care of physician's body. Uh, what the physician must avoid and be aware of, the directions of the physician to the patient, manners to the, uh, to the visitors or visitors, etc., etc. And these actually 20 chapters in one book written 1,000 years ago on medical ethics. Another paper which was published almost 10 years ago talking about the medical ethics in medieval Islamic science and focusing again on this book, Adab al-Tabib by Ar-Rahawi. And uh, this book contained extensive instructions on mutual respect and moral obligations of the physicians, nurses, patients, and other staff. He concentrated also on that mental health is the most important part of health and its violation can result in physical health. This important concept of psychosomatic medicine, which is famous now, and all these values, moral values, which we called for, are actually present nowadays. These ideas still maintain their val validities nowadays and are laid down in several ethical codes of medicine. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, we cannot ignore that Al Rahawi quoted Aristotle, uh, uh, Socrates, Galen, and Hippocrates to support these ideals. But he used, as I mentioned, Islamic traditions as well to further support these points. And we know that actually a distinguished Islamic paradigm that any knowledge considered part of the culture of humanity and does not contradict Islam, should be accepted as a mercy from God. The second book, Akhlaq al-Tabib, which is written by Abu Bakr al-Razi, and this presents also the first model for ethics in Islamic medicine. And he actually felt that it was important not only for the physician to be an expert in his field, but he has also to be a role model. His ideals on uh, medical ethics were divided into three concepts, physician's responsibility to patients and to himself, and patient's responsibility to the physicians. The first thing is duties to himself. He has, the physician has to continue med getting medical education. He should be virtuous. He should have the dedication, and he should look after his appearance and be in a nice way. The physicians, of course, has a duties to the patients, to be kind to the patients, not to be aggressive, to be soft-spoken, compassionate, and behave modestly, to encourage patients and put hope, even if the patient has hopeless case, he still has to instill some hope, and that's actually in the prophet uh, teaching as well. And this is actually inoki, uh, inkel, inkel, uh, sorry, uh, to inculcate uh, positive ideas into the patient, in, uh, I beg your pardon, to, uh, in, uh, to insert positive ideas into the patients and to instill that it is an important method 
in the modern psychology. And he also stressed the importance of treating patients equally and not to go for money, uh, to cure the poor and homeless rather than the rich people. Physicians will be more careful why uh, physicians should be more careful when they are treating women. And he quoted Gallen's sentence, physicians must adhere to God's uh, is sincerely, he should only look at what he has to look there. Now, of course, there are duties of the patients to the physicians, that they should treat the patient, physician kindly and to talk gently with the physician. Al-Razi supports Hippocrates by quoting, find your physician and prepare him before you need him. He attacked the charlatans and the fake doctors, and he uh, said that physicians, of course, must depend on Allah rather than depending on themselves uh, for the cure of the patient. Another famous book, <clears throat> Dr. Sharif Kafil Ghazal also referred to in his article, this book actually for those al-hikmah, which is uh, published by uh, Abu al-Hassan Ali ibn Rabban al-Tabari. And this actually book has several uh, chapters and uh, he actually stated the obligations toward the patients. He's, he also talked about obligations toward the community, towards colleagues, assistants, and so on. And this book was uh, printed in Berlin by Professor Edward uh, Brown in 1928. There is another book for a tabari, uh, Abu al-Hassan al-Tabari called Mu'alajat al buqratiyya uh, and this is uh, a nice paper published almost 10 years ago, reviewing the views of Abu al-Hassan al-Tabari and stating that this book, Mu'alajat al-Bukrati, it has almost 90 moral points on interaction between the physician and the patient mentioned in this chapter. Uh, he actually, uh, uh, the physician should pose the following virtues to, to forgive wrongs, to counsel when he doesn't know, and to be honest, merciful, and upright. All these principles are stated almost 1,000 years ago, clearly. The physician should not be late, should be punctual, should not uh, should avoid wrangling about fees and should be thankful to no matter how much he is paid. And these principles, with particular with contentment, will make him more respected among his clients. Another uh, uh, physician, uh, Ibn Al Ashath, Ibn Abil Ashath, the one who actually talked about the physiology of the stomach. I will talk about that in another lecture, but he also uh, talked about uh, standards in medical ethics. And he talked about, warned about against indifference. This is very important. And he also warned about against charlatans and fake doctors and ignorant quacks as now we see many of them on the internet, unfortunately, are not fit to practice uh, uh, an art of whose doctrines and teaching they are unaware of. Uh, Ibn al-Ashad, this is actually from Encyclopedia of Med uh, uh, Islamic Encyclopedia, uh, written by Remy Kruk. And uh, then we talk about another person, uh, Ali Ibn al-Abbas al-Majusi, or Hali Abbas. He also talked about ethics of medicine in the book called The Perfect Art of Medicine, Kamil As-Sina'a At-Tubbiya. And uh, he actually stated so many things. I don't have the time to talk uh, in details about uh, everyone. But this is another person, Ibn Batlan. He is an Arab Christian physician and philosopher. And he actually demanded high ethical standards for physicians. And he say, said that these physicians should have sound judgment and moral courage, not only learn in medicine. Uh, it is up to the doctor to justify his high calling through his actions and the professional dignity. And if the physicians are always efficient and worthy of their high calling, of course, the public will be more appreciative and honor the healing art. Unfortunately, now we see many attacks on doctors 
and some accuse doctors of lacking some ethics when they some unfortunately few doctors maybe everywhere in the world we see that they are actually like money and they search for money everywhere and other things which i think we can allude to in another lecture uh, this is actually on Ibn Batlan, written by Lawrence Con Conrad in the Encyclopedia as well. And he actually put this book called Da'wat al Atiba, called for doctors. And this involved actually a nice Arabic literature. And he says, when I should die and go to my grave, no one will mourn or my vigil keep, save my medical comrades and books, all of these will be left to weep. Uh, in another book called Tashwiq al-Tibbi written by Saeed al ibn al-Hassan, he also had a third chapter there in, and that's actually on ethics. And he stated that the physician should be faithful and uh, diligent and so on. And she should be well uh, trained. He should answer questions when he's asked and seek more information. He should avoid the pride and tip accurate attempt accurate prognosis, etc., etc. So many uh, calls for medical ethics. This is the book. Another book, actually, an Ibn Salum Al Halabi Rayatul Itqan Fi Tadir Badan Al Insan. This is also uh, uh, also talking in it on ethics. Al Jobari also criticized the frauds in the, in the 13th century. Uh, and those actually, he called them highway physicians, who roamed everywhere. And uh, they actually tried to, to cure or pretend to cure diseases and give medicines without knowledge in such thing. Now, it's interesting to see actually this uh, 450 years old Turkish poem uh, almost 68 lines on medical ethics. This is actually published in Journal of Bioethics Inquiry in 2017. 68 line poem uh, on the medical ethics and uh, ethical art almost actually uh, five, 450 years ago. Now, the last part of my talk will be on clinical records, informed consent and litigation. Now, we know that the practice of medical record keeping dates back to the 5th century BC. And that was when it was dominated by Hippocrates and others. And these actually were there. But it was not until the 20th century when clinical records were routinely used as tools to assess the quality of medical care, uh, to educate physicians, evaluate the outcome, and so on. And it was assumed that the clinical records were not used as legal and educational tool before the middle of the 19th century. But in Arabic, we found with the presence of availability of paper printing and HUSPA system, medical records were incorporated in the medical practice many years ago. <clears throat> as we've seen, actually, the set of rules for medical exams uh, for uh, health workers a set of rules were also uh, regarding patient's care were introduced and a copy of those records were sent to the patient's relative. After the physician sees the patient, he will give a copy of these records to the relatives. And then he actually will write a progress report on daily practice when he is reviewing the patient on the following day and the third day and so on. And the he repeat that and uh, every day until the patient recover or la samahallah dies if he recovers he will get his fees and bonus if on the other hand the patient dies the second or next of kin will go to hakim or a well known physician showing him copies of these what's written by that doctor. If this Hakim find that these were complying with the medical rules and uh, uh, what actually is established at that time, he will tell them that nothing wrong. If he finds on the other, otherwise that there is some uh, negligence on the part of the physician, he will tell the relatives that you have to claim damage for the death of your relative. 
Uh, Dr. El Ajlouni believed that this review of records by the chief physician after death occurs, if death occurs, represent the post-mortem examination of the outcome of therapy by a peer and maybe the first documented reference to the practice of peer review. Now we move on to the informed consent. And the first informed consent, we can say that it was by the Prophet Muhammad in Islam. During his last illness, he asked his wives not to force medicine in him if he gets stuprous through the side of the mouth, but they did against his wish. And when he came around, he ordered them to take the same medicine in the same way given to him. Each one of them did the same with the other. And this illustrates that concept of the patient is essential even if the condition is serious. This not only represents informed consent, but it represents also advanced direct directive, which is a new concept incorporated in the Western medicine, we, uh, of course, in the last decades. Now, little evidence that formalized practice of legally binding informed consent existed before the 19th century. Dr. Kamil Ajlouni actually published a paper uh, a few, many years ago, showing the first legal uh, uh, consent by uh, in 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 uh, Turkey in 1677 for extraction of hernia, and this is actually <clears throat> the informed consent in Turkish, and that's in English, and that's what it says here, and even actually decide everything in front of the Sharia Council and the name and the site of uh, the hernia on the right side, the cost and everything there. And this, uh, this actually document is witnessed by two persons and that actually uh, uh, is very, very clear uh, informed consent. <clears throat> and this actually incorporates the things which are required in the informed consents nowadays when we say that it should uh, uh, have adequate disclosure of information, adequate comprehension of this information, voluntary concept, and competence of the patient uh, to consent. So that document, which is uh, uh, um, 400 years ago, it uh, covers almost, almost all of these. Another paper published in 2006 on the Uthman concept documents, again, uh, the same thing for a patient with urinary bladder disease. And it is stated if his son, the patient actually was a minor, uh, if the son dies because of this operation, uh, the physician or the surgeon will not go to the court for blood money, dia. So that's actually stated clearly. Uh, there is another paper which was published in 2007, uh, again on hernia, as you can see there. And in more recently, last year, there was a nice article and a study on surgery and hernia surgery and informed consent in the 17th century in Istanbul. Uh, the authors actually uh, used Istanbul Sharia court registers and they found 21 informed consent there regarding hernia surgery only. And they found five surgeons, 21 patients. And these documents actually, or contracts, uh, show that patients were informed about the possible complications before operations and their permissions were obtained. And contracts clearly state that the blood money from the surgeon would not be requested if the patient dies during or after operation, unless, of course, there is negligence there. So these actually court records uh, protected free patients and physicians alike from criminal liability. Again, uh, just in, about 10 years ago, uh, this is actually Omar Sai Leglil. He actually published a, a paper that there is an older concept, which is dated back to 1524. 500 years ago, and this is considered so far is the earliest concept document found so far in the literature. So that was back to 1524 
500 years ago. And the, uh, again, as I said, uh, although in the obtaining consent in scientific research from a human beings was considered to have originated from the Nuremberg Code in 1949, this uh, study shows that it was there in 1524. And the last part of my talk in few minutes on litigation, this is a translated documents of a case in which a Muslim patient took a Jewish surgeon to the court for alleged malpractice. And it stated actually here, what happened to the patient, patient went to the surgeon because of wind in his scrotum. And the surgeon inserted the lancet into the scrotum. And what happened that actually blood and pus uh, came out and three days later, the patient died. The, uh, his brother went to the court and he actually claimed that there was negligence of this Jewish doctor. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the judge asked actually witnesses, physicians or surgeons who are skilled in this uh, subject. And they actually testified that this surgeon who did the operation was efficient in this kind of surgery. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, they actually stated that uh, this was done in the right way. And the judge ruled that the surgeon cannot be held accountable for what happened to his brother. And the Jewish surgeon, who is skilled in his craft of surgery, has behaved according to the established professional norms. So this, this, the case was dismissed. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, it's fair to say that the roots of four principles of bioethics are present in Islamic teachings, teachings with different emphasis on individual ones. Chronologically, Islamic medical ethics seems to have considerable effects on the initiation and development in European medical ethics. And two books at least were written in Arabic on medical ethics 1000 years ago, in addition to many chapters written by different physicians, and I've shown that the informed consent is not a Western invention. The original consent document dates back to 1524. Now, finally, I will say, quote, uh, Jonathan Siegel said, it's good to be a seeker, but sooner or later, you have to be a finder. And then it is well to give what you have found a gift into the world for whoever will accept it. And the fact is the Muslims in medical ethics acquired a lot and they gave a lot. And finally, we read actually what was published in 2005 by Drabo and others. Today's Western world might look very different without the legacy of Muslim scholars, scholars in Baghdad, Cairo, Cordoba, Damascus and elsewhere. With this, I will stop here and thank you very much indeed for your attendance. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khairan, Dr. Hassan. Allah uh, alaikum Thank you very much for a very valuable talk um, the comments and everybody is, is um, sharing um, how much they benefit from this jazakumullah uh, khairan sawt al qata kanu i can jazakumullah khair barakallah feek really really quite a great talk uh, mashallah fascinating educational comprehensive jazakumullah khair dr hassan uh, I'm just going to have a very uh, quick uh, question, if you don't mind, uh, till we see if there's any more questions coming from the uh, chat box. Um, I know uh, medical ethics, you always look at uh, the um, what's the current uh, the challenges and, on the time. Uh, I can read a few books in, um, in surgery, which is my specialty. And I, when I read Ibn Nafis on um, his discovery of the... Uh, uh, pulmonary uh, circulation. When I read Al Zahrawi's Mashallah Tasrif, Liman Ajiza and Al Ta'alif, fascinating book. Um, I can see there's no doubt on that time they had to take some challenges. And the men, one of the most challenges actually, 
uh, dissection of uh, Gaddafi's or Tashrikh uh, uh, Jithaf. So my question is, to what extent this really played part? Uh, did they uh, uh, dissect or not? Uh, the way uh, the information has been uh, concluded from uh, many surgical books, probably maybe say most likely yes. I know some fuqaha, they have different opinions on this. I know the al darura So I don't know, how can you please maybe shed light on this, uh, if you don't mind, uh, Dr. Hassan. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's an excellent question, without any doubt. Now, we know for sure that actually this section was practiced by some doctors. And Dr. Muhammad Ali Bar, my friend and brother, has written a book on Ilm al tashrih and he incorporated a chapter on the physicians who actually practiced that. So we know for sure that this was actually practiced. And the way Ibn Nafis and so on describe the circulation, the pulmonary circulation and so on, as you said, it cannot be done without this section. So I think that was done. And there are, of course, many scholars say that the incertain darura, that if the disease or the patient dies of unknown disease, if there is actually suspicion about a crime, if there is suspicion about some misfortune there or something actually unusual in the outcome of that patient, I think many authorities uh, agree to uh, have in this section in such case. So there yes, are limited uh, areas, where not done routinely, not done routinely. And even in Britain, we know that when to call actually for such thing, uh, then we, of course, we call for that when we are suspicious. I remember in 1981, I was in London and I had a girl who was 14 years old, she died because of swallowing glasses. She had actually about one kilogram of glasses she swallowed and without actually having, amazing, without having bleeding. And we called actually at that time, of course, for the section to find out the cause of this. So I think it is, has roots in Islam and it is a practice. Jazakallah khair, barakallah fi. Before I give uh, to Dr. Jalal, Jalal Najjar, he's one of the neurosurgeons uh, from North Syria. Jazakallah khair. Quick questions being asked. Hal al-Majusi Muslim? Al-Majusi, was he a Muslim? Uh, I think some That's people say yes. Uh, some people actually say yes, that he is a Muslim. Uh, and this is why actually they call him Abu al-Abbas al-Ahwazi rather than al-Majusi, so, and Ali Abbas. So I think there is some uh, doubt about it, but Just anyway. Yeah. Dr. Jalal, if you want to unmute yourself, please. Assalamu alaikum, jazakumullah khair. It's fantastic. See you, uh, Professor Hassan, again. Thank you very uh, much. I, I, I did not forget your lecture in uh, ethics and uh, medicine in Homs, maybe more than 10 years ago with Dr. Albar. Anyway, last uh, last uh, week we had a great meeting in Istanbul, and there's many people from the United States and Japan and uh, other worlds. Um, and they were, they were speaking about the history of anatomy uh, as an introduction of the neurosurgical uh, meeting. Um, the Japanese... Um, uh, Colleagues had no idea about the Islamic uh, civilization. I and still re uh, remark as civilization gap and the big uh, gap. And he uh, was uh, uh, surprised when I explained to him that we had a, a lot of uh, history which covered as a big lie with each, uh, the civilization gap. So I uh, certainly want to share with you that we, it's our responsibility to make it again to publish it in not in Arabic language, because they, nobody can read it. I put it in figures, I built it in uh, English, uh, in Journal of Neurosurgery in the United States, 2010, and uh, with the help of Professor uh, Sharif Kaptal Ghazal, we reprint uh, more two articles in England. For the, the section of the uh, cadaver, uh, they were surprised that the Arabic scholars men mentioned it perfectly. For example, uh, 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 Al-Baghdadi, 
بعد أن شرحت ألفي جمجمة وجدت أن عظم الفك السفلي يتألف من قطعة واحدة وليس من قطعتين كما يقول جالينوس and Jalinos he was the, the, the main pioneer of them you know, nobody can accept that somebody will different uh, uh, remain, uh, uh, remarks, his remarks different from Jalinos the other Arrazi he said in his book لقد أتاني رجل سقط عند ظهر الدابة وهو يشكو من خدر وتنمي في إصبعه الصغير وأنا أعلم أن لديه كسر في الفقرة السابعة لأنني أعلم من التشريح أن العصب من الفقر السابع يصل إلى هذه الأصبع. He said that perfectly. So this is our responsibility to make it in other languages to distribute it. And thank you again, thank you, Dr. Hassan and Dr. Sharif for such an easy meeting. Thank you. Thank you. خير أخي. بارك الله. دكتور محمد عثمان. Please feel free, أخي. Just need to unmute yourself if you don't mind. We can't hear you. We can't hear. Can you hear me? We can't. Now we can. If you just okay. please introduce yourself, or I'm sorry. Hello, hello. No. Yeah, yeah. Carry on, Akhi. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Oh, okay. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullah. I think this is a, a very interesting talk. I really enjoyed this, Dr. Hassan, and for those who made this platform available. I just want to ask about whether in the history of uh, Isla uh, Islamic uh, history, whether there are uh, any medical research done, uh, uh, testing different type of procedure or different type of medicine. Uh, you, mean, you, you mean on the medical ethics itself, isn't it? Uh, in the medical ethics what, 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 or, or medical research as yeah. general. Yeah. Let's uh, no. focus, make the most of Dr. Hassan on the medical ethics, inshallah. Okay, no I'll leave it to him to answer, Dr. Hassan. Yeah. Well, I think I mean, we cannot say that there is actually formal research like actually what we see at the moment, but I'm sure there is actually principle of research done when they actually compare the management of one patient to another. So I think it's in a way like actually controlled group, but I, it's difficult to say that there is exactly what in fact we are practicing nowadays when we have uh, larger studies, when we have the statistics and so on. But there is, of course, in the contribution of medicine, I can, uh, if you like, I think Dr. Professor Sharif would decide actually to make a different lecture on Islamic contribution to medical knowledge. That I think is separate from this, which I devoted only to medical ethics today. Uh, so I think there is certainly some kind of research. It's not, as I said, in the formal way we practice it nowadays, but I think there is evidence for that. Jazakallah khair. Okay, we have a question, Said. What are the two elements of traditional Islamic medical ethics ought to be introduced back as a priority into secular modern medicine or medical ethics medicine, in your opinion? Yeah, I think number one, I think we have to ask for itqan, being perfectionist. This is very important for every Muslim physician, nurse, technician, etc., to do his job in the perfect way. I think that's number one. And there is hadith for that. If somebody does anything, I mentioned that in the lecture. I think that's number one. Number two is actually to take the uh, medical education to the best, to follow up what is going on in the West and uh, translate that into Arabic. And I am a great supporter of teaching medicine in Arabic. Without that, I think we cannot grow up. And every country, most countries in the world, teach their medicine in their language. Israel teach in, 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 in its language, uh, uh, Holland, and so on. Everyone 
except for, unfortunately, the Arab world. So I think that's an important point is to get, in fact, this into the uh, practice of teaching and in addition to the English language, not to ignore English language. And we've seen the Professor Sharif in front of us, Dr. Najjar is there, everyone. They, we all actually learned in Arabic and we can talk English. We actually caught up with the, the Western medicine and alhamdulillah, all of us managed to do well. So I think this is actually as another important thing. Another question from uh, um, our uh, beloved brother, Dr. Uh, Abu Bara, Dr. Radwan Khayyat. He just put in question, uh, there's a very strong push in the world now for the euthanasia and the mercy killing. So what is the Islamic view on this, uh, Akhi? Thank you very much. I think we published actually this paper on euthanasia in your journal, Journal of British Association, Medical Association, uh, Islamic Medical Association. I think it's, I put it clearly all the Islamic views on euthanasia. Euthanasia is totally forbidden in Islam. There is, I think, nothing that you have to kill yourself. I think there are things which, in fact, are allowed, like giving medicine, uh, like morphine and so on, to relieve pain. And even if that actually lead to, let's say, at the end of the day, to respiratory suppression, but that's not the intention of the physician. It is actually a practice to give to relieve the pain, but only in the doses which are given according to the uh, standard of practice. But if the patient at the end of the day, after years or months or whatever, uh, reach a stage of respiratory suppression, that I think is the end of his life. But that's not actually uh, something which is intended by the physician. So euthanasia is absolutely forbidden in Islam. Dr. Radwan, do you want to uh, add, uh, do you want to shed light on this? Uh... Uh, Dr. Radwan, he's a consultant uh, uh, psychiatrist in uh, Southampton. Uh, 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 no, no, nothing more. No, I, I totally uh, agree with with the, the Dr. Hassan, uh, and I think it's a it's very good to have a clarity about it as a Muslim because they will we will have a lot of pressure. Uh, from the, in different parts of the world to change mind. And I think it's driven sometimes by mercy killing or trying to um, try to take a patient perspective. But I think uh, if, if you permit this, we'll gradually uh, the circle will, will grow further and further and more people will be either pushed or persuaded or under pressure to accept mercy killing. They, they see it as a their duty to move on to allow people because of the financial or burden on the society. And I think uh, there will be degrading of uh, life uh, value. And that's not for Muslim, that's not uh, for our ethical attitude. Thanks. Absolutely. Totally agree. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sharif, Tfadan. Okay, uh, I think there's probably maybe room for one quick question. Uh, almost uh, finished now. Uh, the uh, uh, One of the doctors here asking, what's the first Muslim university in the history that uh, started teaching medicine and Islamic medicine? In the history, in all the history? In the old history, teaching medicine on the for Muslim, obviously the the Muslim university. Well, I think in the current era now, I think there are actually medical schools who are talking about or incorporating medical ethics. Let's put it that in their curriculum. Now, I think in Saudi Arabia, many uh, universities incorporated medical ethics. Now, if we talk about Islamic medicine. 
uh, or profit medicine, I mean, there was difference between the two. We can talk about that in different lecture, but that actually is something else. And that is incorporated also in several universities in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in different uh, Arab uh, countries. So it is incorporated nowadays there. <clears throat> yeah, Jazakallah khair. I mean, in general, one of the oldest university in, uh, in the Muslim world, Umm Qarawin, in, in Fas, uh, I mean, um, uh, obviously, this is just, just the history. I've got a very quick comment from uh, one of uh, our colleagues, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Muqdad Rawi, he's a consultant uh, plastic surgeon in Newcastle. He's just uh, showing his gratitude at the great uh, lectures, and he would love to invite you in some stage, inshallah, to uh, mm -hmm. probably maybe uh, give similar talk in the British Association of uh, Plastic Surgery, inshallah, in London. Uh, yes, yeah. uh, I think we're a little bit tight for time. Uh, is, is there any more questions somebody would like to? Uh, you can raise hands. Because we've got probably maybe chance for one more question, please. Yeah. Dr. Muhammad uh, Jamal. Yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> it's a great lecture, and we appreciate uh, this type of lecture uh, for us to be educated. My question I also posted in the uh, in the chat, and there's another colleague, I think, from the from also my country, if I understand Somalia. And the first question is, if a doctor determines that a pregnant mother or woman in labor needs a C-section, does he or she need the consent of the patient only or their family members, husband or father? As we understand is the norm, the latter is the norm in many countries. That's the first question. And the, the other question, which I think I, if he doesn't have, I will do it for him. What about if the patient family refuses, not the same case, resuscitation to um, um, uh, to um, peri-arrested or arrested patient? Anyway, uh, what consent? Do, whose consent is required? You mean DNR? If the patient's being labeled as DNR, but the family refuse? The first one is the C section, yeah, yeah. cesarean section. Yeah, the yeah. Second yeah. one. The second one I'm just reading um, from the uh, I took the liberty to read it from the from the chat where it it says maybe Muhammad can Muhammad Mukhtar can explain better. Thank you. Let me answer the question. I think for the C section, I think things in marital issues it has to be consented by the husband and the wife. Anything related to marital issues. But if there is actually an emergency situation, let's say, the husband is not there, you cannot wait for that. I think that is treated in a different way. But we talk when we're talking about things which is not in an emergency situation, the, anything related to pregnancy, it needs to be consented by the husband and wife because it is a mutual uh, project. So I think it is both participating in that project, but emergencies are different way. There is actually a case where in some part of the world, uh, a patient was not put, taken to dialysis because he is a, a, a little kid and he was not taken to dialysis when he's an acute kidney failure waiting for the father. That is not acceptable if it is life-threatening condition. So I think that has to be taken uh, at that time as an immediate decision. I think he probably maybe met the second question, or maybe my understanding is, if it's somebody labeled as a DNR, do not resuscitate, but the family has a different views, what's the obligation of Muslim doctors? Yeah, here actually it is stated clearly that if the family refuse and the three physician competent Muslim physicians decided that this patient is for DNR, it will be left to the family to take the patient to another hospital. So they can have the option of taking their patient to a different territory to be managed there. I think we should probably maybe stop here. If you don't mind, Jazakallah khair. Um, uh, I'm really sorry if there's any technical issue when we started. Inshallah, the, uh, uh, this fascinating talk will be uh, recorded and published, inshallah, uh, in our uh, uh, YouTube channel. 
دي اه اتش اي ام في ما تشانل ان شاء الله اه جزاكم الله خير اجين دكتور حسان بارك الله جريت ات واز اونر ريلي تو هاف يو توداي بارك الله جزاك الله خير everybody waiting until this time and that's on a sunday afternoon بارك الله ثانك يو جزاك الله خير دكتور عبد الرحمن Maybe he would like, to, I don't know, want to add uh, no, a couple no. of... Uh, Jazakum no. Allah and Dr. Hassan uh, for your amazing talk and uh, mashallah the interest uh, from people is very high and that reflects the importance of the talk. Uh, can I ask um, all the audience please, if it takes only like a few seconds, um, uh, I did put in the, um, in the chat box uh, the YouTube channel for uh, him FEMA so we need to subscribe so next time inshallah we will make it stream the streaming online on YouTube it'll, easy, it'll be easier than Zoom but we need 100 subscribers in order to do this for future inshallah so if you just click on the YouTube channel and subscribe to that channel so for future inshallah we can afford this service inshallah Jazakumullah khairan and uh, Jazakumullah thank you very much Dr. Hassan yeah, and Dr. Sharif جزاكم الله خير الله يبارك فيك الله يهويك يا اخي شكرا حبيبي يا الله مزال حسناتك بارك الله السلام عليكم السلام